And then this other one that was really creepy because, you know, like a ladle? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the, mm-hmm. those big ones like in Jurassic Park, the Velociraptor. Was oh, like yeah. And the she's tapping it on yeah, the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like that. But, and it was hanging up on this hook. And you see the ladle lift up off the hook, come over, like, come forward a couple inches and then just drop. As if someone or something lifted it off the, yeah. the hook. no way that this could be real as this creature reached its hand out over my sister's chest and a blue mist came out i remember just screaming for my mom and my dad i lived next to a pretty big military base and airplanes were always coming and going however it suddenly expanded and then shrunk back down to its original size then zoomed off almost like a shooting star Fourteen years ago, my family and I lived in a converted apartment for a mental health facility. At the time, my son was three and used to get nightly visitors in his room that would bother him daily. Welcome class. I'm your host, Mr. Zach Schlager. Alongside me, my cohort in all things supernatural, Mr. Joel Jackson. And you are tuned in to Beyond the Bell Podcast. Are you thirsty for more ghost stories, alien encounters, and tales from the other side? Make sure you're part of the Beyond the Bell community. Class, it's important that you click subscribe on our Facebook channel and join our Facebook group. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. All these links to these accounts are provided in the video's description box. Uncover the uncanny and delve deeper into the paranormal with us. Do you have a spine-tingling tale of the paranormal? or an unexplained event in your school or education field, maybe an extraterrestrial encounter or a mysterious creature sighting, or perhaps you have a compelling conspiracy theory? We at Beyond the Bell, we want to hear from you, especially if your story involves teachers, schools, children diagnosed with autism or any type of learning differences or developmental disabilities. Do not let your story remain untold. Reach out to us on our vast social media platforms. The links to these are on our website at beyondthebellpodcast.org, or you can email us directly at joel.jackson at beyondthebellpodcast.org. We cannot wait to hear about your experiences. Finally, join us in shaping the future beyond the bell. This isn't just a podcast, but a family that Zach, myself, and you are part of. Every penny you donate contributes directly to the production of high-quality content for all of us to enjoy. To donate, simply go to beyondthebellpodcast.org and click on Donate at the top. You can also find the link to our GoFundMe in this video's description. (coughs) Cough, teacher salary. Help us out. (laughs) Yeah, help us out. Welcome, class. I'm your host, Mr. Zach. Alongside me is my cohort in all things strange and spooky. What's up, guys? Mr. Joel Jackson. And we have a banger of an episode today. A banger, man. I've been waiting for this one since the church episode debuted. I've been waiting. Dude, you've been waiting. I've been waiting, man. I've been just so excited. So, I'm really, really pumped. So, today's episode features none other than the mystifier himself, the colossals of clout of paranormal, Mr. Joel Jackson. This is a long time, man. Long time coming. Long time. Dude, I just love your introductions, man. You just keep me hyped up, man. <laughs> Let's go. If, if I ha- if I could cue like the Undertaker theme uh, right now and just have the lights go dark in the room and then you appear out, like that's what I want. That's where we're going to get to. Just hype everybody up, man. This is, this is I love it. Let's, let's get to it. So talking about your experiences that you had, um, class, what we're going to do with Mr. Jackson's story a little bit is we're, we're, we're going to work back to front like a like a mullet right and we're gonna start with the party first but he's got some really really important things that he wants to discuss later in a two-part episode so mr jackson we're gonna break this episode up into two parts right yes sir awesome awesome so we're gonna get started about this haunted boarding school is that correct it is it was a haunted boarding school that i taught at for about two years right after i graduated college nice nice and so uh, geographically for the class, where were you? Where were you living? Where were you in life? Uh, walk us through the environment and, and and how how did you come 
to get hired on at, at such a place? What were you looking for? Dude, that's that's it's actually a crazy story. So my story starts back in December of 2017. Um, I just finished my student teaching and I graduated college and I was job hunting. And like most young people in my situation at that time, I didn't have a lot of interview experience. And my first two interviews went just terribly. And I just took it awful. And I'm the type of person that when something bad happens, I try to research and try to make up for it. And I started researching any type of way of like finding a teacher's jobs. And one of my dreams was that I wanted to teach at a boarding school. I found that type of job really appealing because I was at the stage in my life where I kind of wanted to turn a page on life. And I've always lived in Oklahoma or Texas, and I just wanted to kind of break away from the people that I know or knew and just kind of develop myself and, and really find myself. And so I started applying for jobs all over the country. And I found this really cool kind of teach mark, teacher placement agency. And so they sent my resume to all these cool places and I got a, a couple interviews and I eventually got an interview at a therapeutic boarding school in the Southwest of the United States. And I did a couple of interviews and on the phone and then the founders of the school basically said, hey, man, we really like you. We want you to come and visit the campus. And this family was very affluent, and uh, they flew me out on their family plane. Wow. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah, they flew me out on the fam family Big plane. money. Big money. Big money, man. And they flew me out, and I stayed in their house. They had a lot of houses like, all over the country, but uh, they had one right by campus. And so I got to stay in the house, and I got to – shadow people for a couple of days. I taught a couple of lessons and just kind of got a feel for the environment. And I just really fell in love with it because I wanted to be like kind of like Robin Williams in the Dead Poet Society. Okay. And I wanted to make it like, I wanted, really wanted to impact my students' lives and be a lasting influence on them. And unfortunately, um, the student population at the school, they weren't there by their own choosing. Um, they were dealing with addiction issues, emotional issues, a lot of trauma. So is that, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Jackson, was that what you were looking for? Like more of an at-risk boarding school or any boarding school? Well, any boarding school. Gotcha. I never really thought of that type of boarding school, but I went through a lot of stuff in my life at that point. And so I kind of related to them. Sure. At, at, that, at that time. And I felt like, wow, man, God put all this stuff in my life, prepared me for this. And also another like really attractive feature about the school is that a large portion of the student population was diagnosed with some type of learning difference, like oppositional defiance disorder or ADHD. And I always wanted to work in a school with that type of population because like just like me and you, Zach, we went to a, a school that was specially designed to treat work with students like that. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like my dream. And so the school had all these things that I liked about it and I accepted the position and since it was a therapeutic boarding school it was a year-round program and so the school director said hey we need you like here now to start teaching and so in like a week and a half I packed up all my stuff and I moved out to the school and like most boarding schools it's in an incredibly scenic and beautiful location like it was in the desert but there's mountains and oh, wow. the weather was perfect it, it snowed like a whole bunch but it was in an incredibly remote area. When I did eventually find an apartment in a really, really small town, like half the size of Gainesville, wow. um, I had to drive like 30 minutes one way to get to this dirt road that I had to travel on for like five or six miles in order to actually reach the school. And this dirt road, when I say dirt road, it's not really dirt, it wasn't gravel. It was, it was like a fine red sand. and. The people who built this road cut through this road through these series of hills, okay? And so, and there wasn't a lot of space on the sides. And so there's like a wall surrounding each side of the road and it's like at a 90 degree angle. And whenever it rained, which it happened to, to do a lot during monsoon season, which is like in July, August, September, water would flow down these side of these walls and start pooling on the road. And these pools could range anywhere from like, you know, one or two inches to over five feet deep. And in my picture that I'll put in our website about this episode, I have two pictures of uh, the road flooded. And the one on the left 
is a portion of the road that wasn't even dug through the hill. So it was, wow. a, fl- it was a flatter area. So it wasn't that bad. And on the right, you could see me driving in a coworker's pickup, and the water's up to almost up to like the door handle. Wow. We're driving, and so whenever it rained, and you didn't get out quick enough, you were stuck on that campus, and you couldn't leave or get to it. So the threat of a flash flood really isolating you guys to almost an internal community sounds mm-hmm. like a, the threat there was pretty plausible. Every time you, yeah, it, it, monsoon it was. season, dude, it was it, it was scary, man. And we uh, we had a caravan sometimes, uh, and it was just yeah, it was it was, it was definitely. Hectic. So anyways, so this dirt road also cut through this large portion of land owned by the Bureau of Land Management, which is kind of like a national park type of Wait agency. a minute, wait a minute. Are you talking about the government? The government. The government. Oh, boy. And so this Bureau of Land Management land completely like surrounded the school's campus. Okay. And on the border of the school's campus about... Like less than a mile away, there was this old Spanish presidio, and presidio it means fort, and this fort goes back to 1776. When I say fort, it's basically ruins. Like all that's left that there now is just kind of like a couple of foundation pieces. But that was nearby the school, and the school itself consisted of about of about 15 buildings. And several of them were remnants of an old Wild West ghost town that was abandoned. Um, there's a, another ghost town bigger nearby, and they started at the same time, and then eventually more people went to this other town, that, and that became a ghost town, and then eventually the other town became a ghost town. But when the founders of the school purchased the property, they restored and renovated these buildings into like office space, um, some dorm rooms, and a really cool recreation center, which is the kind of centerpiece of a lot of my stories and experiences for this episode. Cool. Well, let's let's delve into some of that because what I admire about so much of what you just said is that you were a young man trying to find your way in life. And not only trying to find your way in life, but you, you were also cognizant enough that while whatever you were coming out of you also want to instill hope and kindness and compassion to the youth around you and by you and so i think that's pretty admirable that you were choosing this field to go into but you step foot on campus everything's hunky dory when did you feel like something was different okay so the first time i heard the school was haunted was it was like two two and a half weeks or three weeks on the job and it was at the end of one class period and i overhear two students talking and they're talking about how they about their experience playing with a homemade ouija board they made out of a pizza box that they took from the cafeteria never a good sign ne- man. <laughs> yeah, never ne- a good <laughs> and, and so you can imagine me listening to this so I, i'm a little interested so i'm listening and then they're describing you know what what they were communicating with, and a nearby student overhears them, and he gets really upset, and he says, hey guys, you stop that. We already have a lot of weird stuff going on. We don't need you guys like agitating even more. And then more kids start, you know, piling in, and I, I stopped. As kids do. Yeah, and I stopped, and I gave a lecture on, you know, why Ouija boards are bad, and what a good roommate looks like, and good roommates don't open up portals to other realms that can't be closed. I mean, I, I don't think I would be appreciative if my roommate yeah. was opening <laughs> portals to another dimension. Yeah, so I gave that lecture, but then right after that, I went and told the head person of what we called Mil- the Emilio Department. Emilio in French means family. And so that was the department that worked with the kids after school and after the therapy sessions. And, and I told him, hey, I've heard too kids talking that they were playing with the witch board in the dorms you might kind of want to check that out he said like oh that's great let's just stir up even more activity than we already have going on and i said what what activity and i love a good ghost story so i asked him and kind of inquired more about it and he said oh yeah this place is like totally like haunted he, he told me about the school being uh a former wild west town and i knew about that but then he starts describing some of the experiences and he says that, oh, we have even security camera footage of some of them. I said, like, oh, dude, can you show it to me? And he's like, oh, yeah. And he showed me 
a couple, like two videos of the cafeteria around like two o'clock in the morning, and they had like round tables with plastic chairs, like the ones in this room around it. And all of a sudden, you see this one kind of in the middle left section of the cafeteria just starts sliding out from under one of the tables for about ten feet. Wow. Yeah. And I said, like, oh, man, you're, you're playing a joke on me. I said, oh, no, no, we, we got him in more. And then he showed me a security camera fo footage of the kitchen. Because, um, again, the school, there's a lot of, they have to be very strict and they have to, to record everything for, like, safe liability reasons. So there's cameras everywhere. And they show a video of a can of tomato soup it was sitting on the countertop, like those metal, metal kitchen countertops, and it just slides off. And then... This other one that was really creepy because, you know, like a ladle, mm -hmm. like, you know, the, mm -hmm. those big ones, like in Jurassic Park, the Velociraptor was... Oh, like, yeah, and the she's kitchen. tapping it on yeah, the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like that, but and it was hanging up on this hook, and you see the ladle lift up off the hook, come over, like, come forward a couple inches, and then just drop. As if someone or something lifted it off the, yeah. the hook. Yeah, and that, 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 just, that just freaked me out, because at the time... I was living on campus, and I was living in this one building that I'll describe later, but it was one of the more haunted places, and so that, that just kind of, that, that scared me. And then, so after that, this million guy gets his crew, and they do a, like a campus-wide sweep of all the dorms, and so they're going through all this stuff, and they find like five Ouija boards. And he said, like, we, we have like a Ouija infestation. We also had another department related to the therapeutic side called equine therapy hmm. and that's just basically therapy outside with horses because um studies have shown that patients are they feel way more comfortable when they're outside with the horses and they communicate their feelings a lot um, easier than they would in a traditional talk therapy i mean it makes sense yeah. you know i mean we're bonded with our animals and so and uh, so this is so i'm going on a side tangent so the school whenever a kid came to the school they were given a horse that they had to take care of Oh, okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. So they're giving their, their horse, and I, it's just I found it so funny because like they had to, they had to clean it, they had to clean out the stalls, and I loved like watching the kids clean out like the animals or you know, clean out the barn yeah. or take care of the horse because you see them in like most of them are pretty affluent, so they're in like Gucci and Prada, and they're like shoveling the horse manure. Out. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and so when, when two worlds collide, huh? Yeah, and um, I remember this once one practice that they do is they would pair a horse with a personality opposite of the child so that they can work on certain issues. For example, if you have a really shy, timid child who doesn't really stand up for himself, they'll pair him with a really domineering horse that won't do anything unless you are assertive and you say it, you know, with, with me. Wow. And I remember, have you, have you seen the Sandlot? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the catcher and he he had freckles and oh yeah was yeah that yeah Cam? Um, was it? i'm drawing a blank on his name but i i do know who you're talking about it was um it was porter. Yeah, porter. Porter, porter yeah porter okay so this kid uh, like a uh, bus hard he looked exactly like him he was paired with this this horse oh, what was his name it was, it was the biggest one it's the most domineering one i think it was called um old thunder title of my um erotic dancer name when i retired from education <laughs> <laughs> And so I remember I'm, I'm watching him, and he's trying to saddle the, whole, the horse, and he's just starting. And the first thing you do is, uh, when you saddle horses, you put a blanket on top of the horse's back. And so <laughs> he puts a blanket on top of his back, and he reaches over to get, I think it was like a saddle or something. While his back's turned, the horse reaches around and then bites the corner of the blanket and rips it off. And he keeps on doing this like like 10 times in a row. And this kid's like going crazy. It's just, it's just pretty funny. So anyway, that's kind of... Oh, my little side danger. So there's these different departments that treat kids certain issues. Yeah, yeah. And they had a they had a Ouija infestation. Yeah, too. and so so there's a Ouija infestation. So they go and in our, our campus white faculty meeting, they was like, hey, look out for Ouija boards stuff. We we have a Ouija problem. But one of the places that I had my own personal experience at, and a lot of other people had, was this one building that was the recreation center. And it was one of the original structures to the ghost town. And it was the town's old saloon and brothel. Hmm. And it was a two-story building. On the first floor, you had one big room that had all these, like, 
consoles, like you had PlayStation, Nintendo 64s, Xboxes, oh, wow. anything, anything in all these plasma screens. And the other room had like old arcade games like Pac-Man and that type of thing and ping pong tables and that sort of thing. And the kids, if they were good, they would get rec time once, once a week during school week and during the weekend. And so that's what they used that. But on the second floor where the brothel used to be, they turned that into basically faculty like housing. So whenever oh, there was something sure happened, sure they and, did. And then that, that's where I stayed for my first two, uh, like you know two months. But nothing happened to me there. Mm-hmm. But I remember my big event happened. It was during basketball season, and it was towards the end of monsoon season. And we had an evening basketball practice, and. Basically, we knew a storm was coming in, and it was coming in right in the middle of my basketball practice and where I had like about an hour and a half left. So I knew I wasn't going to get out in time. And I had a rough day. It was, it was tough. The kids were, were hard, and I had just done a really long, grueling basketball practice, so I was just wiped. And I could have stayed in this one kind of like trailer home where they house mostly all the other like faculty, or I could stay by myself in the rec center. And... Being an introvert, I need time to be alone to recharge. And it's like, okay, I'm going to choose the the rec center. And so after dinner, I go to the bedroom and I start grading. And I hear the kids come in for their their weekly game time, and I hear all the screaming and you know and whatever like you know kids do when they play video games. And after about two hours, they leave, and I start falling asleep. And about maybe around 12:30 or one o'clock in the morning, I'm woken up to the James Bond Golden Eye main menu theme song. You okay, I uh, vaguely remember it, man, but... Yeah, we'll play been, it in the background of this for you, for you guys. Okay. Okay, and so I think a kid has stuck into the building, because that happens a lot. They're, they're crafty, and so I wanted to sneak down and I catch him, and then before I go tell Millie and get him in trouble, I wanted to beat him in a couple games. Okay. And try to kind of build rapport with him before I get him in trouble. Yeah. And so I'm sneaking down this the stairway and I get to the landing and the landing there's this doorway that leads into the game room and I peek around and the room's completely dark all the lines are turned off except for one plasma screen TV and the Nintendo 64 are, is on to the menu screen of the cold night game just straight powered up and at first like I didn't think anything creepy I, I thought I'd okay, be still in here and so I started checking the room and realized all the doors are locked from the in- inside, and there's nothing there. And so that's that's really creepy. So I go to the head Billy guy who was really good friends with. I shared my experience with him, and he wasn't very like shocked, which was like, hey, this is a, like a pretty crazy story. He said, oh man, this happens all the time, especially with the James Bond Goldeneye game. Interesting. And I know. And I asked him, why does like you know whatever is going on here like the James Bond Gold- Goldeneye game? And guess what he said? Because James Bond. As a license to thrill. Oh, uh, that's good. But no, but um, I'm going to quote. Let me pause right there. I'm going to quote one of the students earlier this week. Oh no, I just did a little throw up in my mouth. <laughs> Mr. Jackson. Okay, so he shares his his stories with me from the rec center when, when he stayed there. One night in particular, he's shaving in the bathroom, and he's at the sink and built into the walls like those medicine cabinets that have like a glass door and basically two pill bottles that were sitting on separate shelves just topple over into the sink that's interesting man i mean you have and this is still the same building ish right the, mm-hmm. the ladle things happen yeah. all in the same location i'm just curious did you ever find out your liaison here that you're you're running this through did you ever ask him like how long he worked there so he was a retired Green Beret, and he worked in special operations. There's a really big nearby military base that all the faculty that worked with the kids after school came from. And he would work part-time at the school, and he was also a private security contractor. Basically a mercenary. Right, so right. He, he, was, he was a tough dude. He was huge, man. And so he'd, he'd go on extended trips, you know, doing that, but then he'd come back. But he worked there for about, like, 10 years. Okay. A lot of the faculty there worked over really long time because it sounds like all the things that you've described so far from the ouija boards to things moving to a 
again, electronic phenomena, which it's, it's, I find that to be really interesting. It just seems like no one was shocked by it until the, the new kid on campus arrived, IEU, and was kind of caught off guard by all this stuff, but everyone else seemed to be like, well, <laughs> it happens. I just, wa- I just want to know, do you think that the owners were aware? I think there's there's stories there's stories and a lot of the stories I'm sharing with you happened way before I started working so they're just right. they're they're sharing with me, but again this this area is just like a, a unique part of the country there's a lot of history, and when you think about really old parts of the country you think of immediately start thinking of like the East Coast of Massachusetts and, mm-hmm. you know, and Salem really, really, and all the but actually like the oldest part of the country is the United States Southwest because that's where the Spanish came up from and first started settling, and then also you have a whole bunch of Native American history as well. And there was like, around the campus, there's just tons of Native American sites. A lot of Apache, Navajo. When you hear stories about the skinwalkers and stuff, like, they come from these places. Okay. Okay, so there's a lot of you know, natural energy there, but also I think the schools just have a lot of natural energy. Right. And this school had a lot of natural energy, but a lot of it, I think, was really negative and emotional. And because of all the kids there, they're going through really really tough right whatever whatever potential uh, emotional baggage that these kids were probably bringing on depositing into the environment Mm -hmm. right probably what's over there you know feeds off it they amplified it maybe perhaps amplified it for sure and so here's another story so again uh this milieu guy he he was sleeping in his bed one night and he wakes up he was having a charter horse and he said because they went hiking that day, and he sees on the right side of the room a shadowy figure, and it crosses in front of him in his bed, and takes a turn and walks straight through the bathroom door. And later on, I forgot to mention this. They say there's ghosts from the Wild West town, but there there's also a, unfortunately an employee who worked in the milieu section that died of an overdose mm. in the bathroom supposedly, and so. We believe that's that's him. Wow. So that's kind of the story of the wreck sitter. Because that's where a lot of the experiences I heard from other people happened. Another major vocal point was this old Spanish Presidio. And again, this while researching for this podcast, I found out that this old Spanish Presidio was built on top of an old prehistoric Native American site. And construction started on it in 1776 and and it overlooks it's on top of this bluff and it overlooks for about like 10 miles everything around it but and right below is a really important river that runs through it and if you're in a desert you need water and so they were like looking out for bad guys and also they need water so this was like a perfect spot however as soon as they started building it it was being attacked by Apache Indians. And they were really crafty. And because, like, at that time period, the currency for Plains tribes were horses. Mm. Okay, so as more horses they had, more money and power and status you had. So they would come and they would attack the fort and steal the horses. And one, one of the ways that they would do that, they would send out a small group of guys and they'd cause havoc. And the Spanish soldiers who were in this fort with no cell phones or TV, so they're bored, they want action. So they all start charging out towards that small group and they would lead them away and then the main group of warriors would come and they would take the fort like burn stuff down burn crops you know steal horses it's like almost not like like Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd that right thing. yeah 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 and if it was really bad okay that main group of Indians they wouldn't attack the fort they'll trail behind the main Spanish army while they're following the small group and how the Spanish fought they right as they got close to their enemy, they would dismount off their horses, tie their horses up, and then they'd sneak on foot to try to like, surprise them. Well, the Apaches knew this, so they just waited for them to tie up their horses, and they'd go steal their horses, and then they were stuck on foot in the middle of the desert, where they, you know, they're like 30 miles away from the fort, and you're in a desert, so you, the elements get you. I was like, yeah, it's pretty much game over. Yeah, game over. Well, that reminded me of... Uh... Uh, unfortunately, Dumb and Dumber is what popped in my brain when they stiff sea bass with the check, <laughs> and, and Lloyd's talking to Harry in the van, and he's like, "Oh, so they get away scot free?" He's like, "No, they catch up to him a half a mile down the road." And <laughs> <laughs> so it's wild. My next series of stories revolve around this fort, and there's this one teacher 
that had been there a long time. And for like the first seven years, he lived at the nearest big city, closest to campus, and that was about two hours one way. And so he would commute and stay on campus during the weekdays and go back home on the weekends. So he had a lot of spare time in the evening. And so he loved going and hiking around the trails around that fort, and that's what he did every day. And one night he's hiking around the creek right below the, the fort, and he realizes like, that he lost track of time, and he has like 35 minutes before it gets completely dark, and he's like, like three and a half miles away from his car. So he starts hightailing, and while he's running, he sees around half a dozen shadowy figures crossing the creek on his side towards the opposite bank in a line. And he described it to me as like people on like horses. Wow. Yeah. And my theory is that they were just, you know, Spanish troops that got, you know, ambushed crossing the river or in the desert, something like that. And that was just like, that, that, was, that was a creep point. I, but I've been around that area a lot too. I loved going out there. I take my kids out in classes and we'd, we'd literally find airheads and spear tips. And, and I mean, the, the Milia person who I told you all these stories, he was also one night he was patrolling in one of the school's little ATVs around the, the perimeter of the school around like two or th- two o'clock in the morning. And he's driving along and ahead of him, he sees the figure of an old, like, like a woman, like hunched over with blankets wrapped all around her body and the back of her head. And it's winter time. And unfortunately, we're really close to the U.S. border. And it wasn't uncommon for like a migrant, migrant who to, got you know he who's either like you know intentionally left behind by the coyotes or they got lost to wander on campus asking like for food and water and would give that give that to them and then we call like you know the authorities and you know have them like you know sent out. So this milieu guy, he stops his vehicle, he radios for some backup for someone who can speak Spanish because he doesn't speak Spanish, and so his vehicle stopped and the lady's walking forward and she kind of like rounds a corner. Not very, like not very far away ahead of him, but he starts driving towards her and rounds the corner, and he can't find her. And then he radios for even more backup, and they search the perimeter of the school. Never saw a single trace of her. Hmm. So, did you have a good enough rapport with this guy that you felt like he was always telling you the truth about it? I thought it was pretty truthful because. He was just there a long time, and we, we just, when I moved up there, I was kind of, I didn't really have anybody to talk to, so we just kind of like bonded. He was in a kind of like similar situation. He he had a, a more developed life than I did, like socially, but early, especially early on, I just hung out with the kids and the milieu people after school a lot. And so I felt that he was a pretty trustworthy guy. And he went to this church that I went to for a little while. Um, and he was a, good, a God-fearing guy. He saw a lot of things. We talked about military history all the time. Hiking, hunting, fly fishing. We loved fly fishing together. And I thought he was a pretty reliable source. Was he at all... Did you, did you ever have conversations with this guy about whether or not he believed what he was seeing was real? I thought he... I thought he, I thought he believed what he was seeing was real. And it wasn't just him. There's like, you know... And there's just so, so many just minor things that people just also reported. For example, I personally, I never saw like a shadow figure or anything like that, but when I was on campus, I'd work in my classroom in the schoolhouse by myself till like 12.30 I'm a night owl, okay? Like you, you've gone text for me. I've got it. So I love, I, I love- Mr. Nothing. Jackson burns the midnight oil. <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm on like a trail of something, I, I zone in and I just start working on that for like nonstop. And I love working in the middle of the night because I can listen to podcasts and, and just kind of dive down into rabbit holes and schoolhouse which wasn't very big but there's like maybe like you get a big common area in the middle and you had small classrooms kind of like the size of mine surrounding it and there's only one teacher for like each subject for example I, I taught all the history and social studies classes and the science room was right across from mine and around like 11 o'clock I just hear like cabinets opening and shutting mm. and I said oh that's you know so and so's here early you know or you know late and so I'd pop out of my classroom to go say hey say hey he was also the, the other basketball coach so i just wanted to like you know, just chat with him for a little bit and there's no one there so in this grand scheme and stage in life that you were in on a scale of one to ten one being not at all ten being i'm all the way in where did you fall in terms of in your belief in the paranormal 
or interest in the paranormal. Well, I'll dive down to like, like, kind of like the origins and how it got started and you know, becoming fascinated and interested in, in paranormal conspiracy theories in the next episode. But I was pretty aware of stuff. Okay. But also during this time period, the reason that I didn't have a lot of experiences because it's my personal belief that I was at a strong relationship with God hmm. at that time period. I had been through all this obstacles and problems that I had overcome and that gave me a lot of faith in and just seeing God work in my plan, and that just kind of really motivated me to just become stronger. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of shielded me from experiencing more paranormal activity there. Absolutely. I think that's why I didn't see much things there, other than going downstairs and seeing that TV on. Yeah. Well, it just, it, I mean, it echoes so much of the church episode because, you know, I mentioned it back in episode two. I, I didn't go in with the notion of, like, I'm walking into a haunted place. Mm-hmm. I was walking in to do a job, and you were also walking in to do a job for the youth at this, and and it's always interesting when you kind of almost, I think our bodies rationalize a lot and try to justify a lot. Oh, that's just the air conditioning. Oh, that's just Mm -hmm. the faulty foundation, doors opening, whatever. We try to find answers for it. It's just our human nature. But I find it interesting that, you know, so many people had these experiences where they just they no could no longer refute coincidence mm-hmm. you know to environment shifting or faulty electrical wires in my opinion we grew up in the same time era there's no way that thick n64 button was that loose that that console could turn mm-hmm. on by itself yeah you know i mean we're talking video game cartridges that had to be inserted so mm-hmm. if it wasn't even seated right and if you didn't blow that cartridge, I was gonna first, say, I was you know. like, you had to do the old, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the old good old blow on it, and 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 get it to work. And so there's a lot of factors that I find that are really interesting that would make it almost improbable to be mm-hmm. a coincidence, especially repeated coincidence. Mm-hmm. But continue on, man. I'm just I'm fascinated. And so my last experience that I witnessed there, it, it didn't take place on campus. It was. Just right after I just finished my contract and I was moving back home and it was in around August and it was like 110 degrees and I was cleaning out my car at night because I couldn't do it during the day. And I'm in my apartment's parking lot in this town and this town's right next to this really huge military base. So I'm cleaning out my car and I get out and I'm taking a drink of water and I'm looking up and I see shooting across to my right, this ball of light, and it's white. And it stops a little bit ahead of me, and it's hovering, and it expands, and gets, it gets bigger, like three, three times bigger. And then it contracts back down to its original size, and then zooms off across the sky like a shooting star. I love it. And in the class, you're gonna recognize that part, because that part is in our trailer. And every time I hear the trailer, and I hear that part come off, I just, I wish I had a time machine to go back and just witness that because that's the one that always gets me a little goosebumpy where I'm like, yeah. how does something flying expand to it three times its size and then shrink back down and then go back? Man, I, I have no idea. I, and I was just perplexed at the time. Just like absolutely perplexed. So I, I didn't like immediately think you if I was just like, what's going on? My immediate thought was, oh, that's just people at the Ford testing new stuff. And then it's like, oh, could have been a UFO. Could have been. Could have been. And what year was that? Do you remember? So that was probably 2018 or 19. I know I accepted the position in June of 2017. And I stayed there for like, yeah, it should have been 2019. Well, I think, I think 2017 is when they finally released that famous USS Nimitz Tic Tac video. Yeah, that was and, a crazy one. And, you know, it's interesting, again coincident loosely used here that you're in that not in the location but you're in the same year period that these orbs and these tic tacs and these whatever anomalous flying vehicles are being caught in our skies that you're also kind of being attached to that because not too far in the from probably where you were you know in that area i remember being a child watching live on tv the phoenix light episode Mm -hmm. where they had a dozen glowing orbs about three miles long forming like this triangular craft and you see like a small beacon light approaching 
and they blink out in random order and it, and it turned out later on that that small airplane that was flying was actually Kurt Russell mm. calling call, calling it in like yeah there's a, there's a a massive craft in front of me that's shaped like a, a mm. black triangle V and all these lights but I remember like you know stuff in the southwest man it just hits different yeah it does so I've let me tell you one story, okay, guys. And this isn't from a credible source, okay. So this guy didn't believe him at all, okay. So he was just kind of like a really weird dude. He was in part of the BLU section, and I remember when I first started working there, like he invited me to play um, what's the card game with the monsters and stuff. It's really big, Magic, Magic the Gathering. Oh, Gathering. Magic! I was like, so, Pokemon? <laughs> no, 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 no. So Magic the Gathering, and, and he was just he was just a really like unique guy, and. Uh, he would come into the rec center in the middle of the night when the kids were asleep. He'd play video games all night. And this rec center was situated, so there's two rooms. And in between them, there's kind of like a, a laning area for a staircase, for the staircase that goes up, okay? And there's a doorway in between, connecting like both, both sides that doesn't have a door. And he's playing video games, and he looks to this corner of his eye, and he sees what looks like peeking around the, the edge of the door frame, a head and two hands like holding onto the side. Ew. Almost as if something was like crawling along the sides of the wall and peeking around. And I drew a picture because like, it's so hard to describe what happened and I'll show it to you here, Zach. And I posted it on our website, guys. So you see like he was, he was staring out into like dark sides of the other room. And right. The, the staircase, they turn up like this and then cut up back up like that. And peeking around the top of the door frame was the su- supposed figure. And that's, and that's what he said he saw. And he said he never played video games after that in that place again. Like he, he would go in there for work with the kids, but he would never go alone in that building. But again, this guy was kind of. Ah. So, kind of flaky. Yeah, kind of flaky, but that's just another story I heard, so... You know, the, the realm of possibility is there. The realm of possibility is there. It wouldn't be surprising if it was something. Yeah. Given given the enormous bits of activity. But, Mr. Jackson, this has been wild, man. Dude, it, it has been wild, man. This is... Uh, I love this first part of the story. I, I, if you're leading with this, I can't even begin to think what you have in store for us in our class in, in episode two. It's going to be fun, man, I'm, and I'm looking forward to it. I love it, man. Well, it's about that time, I think. You want to wrap? Let's wrap it, man. Let's, let's, let's do it. So we have... We have some homework for you guys to do. If this episode gives you goosebumps, then press the like button, comment your thoughts, and share that you're vibes. If you're new, don't be a stranger. Subscribe to Beyond the Bell and step into the unknown with us. And again, we are still taking your stories. We want the spine tingling. We want the unexplained, the paranormal if you've had an extraterrestrial encounter or a mysterious cryptid creature sighting, we also want to hear that as well, or conspiracy theory. But here at Beyond the Bell, we're also looking for educators. So our teacher colleagues out there, um, you're in day in and day out in some of these older locations. And if something has gone strange in your classroom, we want to hear from you. So again, the links in these descriptions are below at our website. You can contact us at joel.jackson at beyondthebellpodcast.org or go directly to our website and click the contact tab. Finally, please help us take Beyond the Bell to new heights. Remember, this show isn't just about Zach or myself but an entire community of paranormal enthusiasts just like you. Every donation matters to us as it aids in creating premium quality content efficiently. Visit beyondthebellpodcast.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. The link is also available in the description section of this video. And remember that all of your proceeds just go to helping us grow in technology, devices. We want to start exploring some of these places, mm-hmm. right, Mr. Jackson? So we do. We need some cameras. We need some uh, better audio equipment to get some evidence for you guys. Uh, we're just putting this out there for you all um, and, and entertainment because we are still teachers at the end of the day. With that, I'm going to go ahead and say class dismissed. <laughs>